uh, Galileo Auditorium and Microsoft. I'm honored today to, to be able to introduce Dr. Doug Lynn from UC Santa Cruz, who's going to talk about the robust emergence of diverse planetary systems. Um, Dr. Lynn got his Bachelor's of Science at McGill University and his PhD at Cambridge. And after that, he, he took a postdoc at, in the other Cambridge at Harvard um, for a while and then moved to UC Santa Cruz where he's been ever since, I believe. Um, I was, I am, uh, again, honored to introduce Dr. Lin. He's one of the leading theorists in understanding the formation and evolution of planetary systems, um, which is a field that's, that's really exploded in the last 15 or 20 years. Um, I first became familiar with Dr. Lin in the, the uh, famous Bay Area star formation meetings that used to occur at NASA Ames during the 90s. Um, the, this is where a, a series of some of the biggest names in the field of star formation would meet to discuss new work. Um, they were always very lively and entertaining meetings and, and uh, could be quite intimidating for young postdocs, but it was always good to see these, the people who were really um, leading this field, talking and arguing in, um, in, in, in a very friendly way. So uh, Dr. Lim was one of the early converts to going from studying star formation to studying these new extrasolar planets, which were being discovered um, first in the, in the mid-90s. And he was one of the first to, to um, recognize and explain how these giant Jupiter-sized planets could end up right next to their stars in these three-day orbits, which, which was a surprise to many people. Um, in addition to studying star and planet formation, Dr. Lin has studied the formation of the earliest first-generation stars in ancient globular clusters and galaxies, the dynamics of stellar clusters, the formation and structure of galaxies, including our nearest neighbors, the Magellanic Clouds, um, and the formation of, of massive black holes in active galactic nuclei. And basically, if it's out there in space and it, it moves, Dr. Lin is working to understand and explain it. Um, so please welcome me and in, in, please join me in welcoming um, Doug Lin for our talk today. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to be here. And uh, Bay Area has always been my home. Uh, so I'm going to start. Uh, I think this audience does not need to be motivated why we are interested uh, in uh, understanding planet and planetary systems is to search for the possible signs of life out there. And, uh, and of course, uh, as uh, uh, have been said that the big uh, stimulation uh, that occurred was almost exactly 25, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, when uh, the first extrasolar planets was uh, firmly established, uh, first with radio velocity and, um, um, and, and some of this follow-up work is actually done here in the Bay Area. Um, and then um, the explosive growth continued, especially in the last, uh, you know, last decade or so, and uh, with the launch of the Ke uh, Kepler spacecraft, which is uh, headquartered here, uh, just uh, uh, less than a mile away. And uh, by looking at uh, the transit of these uh, uh, planets uh, with their host star, uh, you can actually measure their uh, particular size. Uh, in the 20 years or so uh, since uh, the discovery of 51 Pegasus, that our technology has improved to the point that uh, we are able to detect planets with uh, masses and sizes uh, that is three orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the first planet that was discovered. And uh, uh, right around here, uh, this is to uh, uh, give you a, a indication of the kind of gas giants that you can discover. And this is kind of like an Earth type of uh, planets that you can discover. And uh, uh, the red indicates the discovery made with transit, and the blue indicates that uh, discovery made with radio velocity surveys. And there are many other techniques are being introduced and I won't go through them because this talk is mostly theoretical. And uh, many of these uh, uh, new observational approaches are extremely innovative and they will bring fruits. For example, 
uh, such, uh, such efforts such as uh, direct imaging and uh, uh, microlensing and perhaps even uh, astrometry uh, at some point. And most of these activities are uh, flourishing, especially around the Bay Area. Now, what do we know today? What we know is that planets are everywhere. And uh, in fact, uh, here is a discovery that was a uh, you know, follow-up announcement even as a few years ago. And uh, these are the discoveries made by, with, with Kepler spacecraft. And, uh, and today, uh, this number has uh, more, than, uh, uh, more than doubled. And uh, uh, we can start to do some statistics to describe their um, overall properties. And for example, we can measure their planetary size and then cast the sizes in these beams. Here is Earth size, and here is something like a Jupiter size. And as you can see, between Earth and a couple of Earth's radii, we actually find planets around almost half of the stars that has been done in, in this survey. And uh, so uh, it tells you that the planets are plenty, but especially uh, rich in this population are so-called super-Earths. And uh, these are planets with radii uh, you know, within a couple of times or three times that of Earth. And there may very well be another huge population uh, that uh, with a radius that's smaller than these uh, than the Earth, but we have we are not able to detect them at this point. Um, and radio velocity at the uh, uh, radio velocity survey has revealed a similar type of trend, namely there's a rich population of uh, super Earths and uh, a marginal population, maybe about uh, ten or fifteen percent. Uh, of stars similar to our sun carries gas giants. And that fraction decreases with a stellar mass. Okay, so today we, uh, the first question we need to ask is how can planets form in such a prolific way? And secondly, uh, why that there is this such contrast, this size distribution or the mass distribution? Now, in addition to the ubiquity, and we find that planets um, are also extremely diverse. This is like living systems on Earth. Every corner of Earth you can find life, but the form of life is very diverse. And uh, uh, similarly, uh, in the planetary systems, and the first thing we can see is that many of these systems have highly eccentric orbits, um, you know, planets with highly eccentric orbits, and uh, not quite like what we see in the solar system. And secondly, is that um, the, in the solar system, the extent of the solar system on, uh, closer to the sun uh, is stopped at Mercury. And interior to the orbit of Mercury, there's hardly anything. However, most of these uh, super Earths and gas giants, uh, the first detected gas giants, so-called hot Jupiters, are found very close to the star. And uh, partially because they're the easiest objects to detect, partially it also tells you that they are these odd um, populations and, uh, and they are out there and they, they are not at all like our own solar system. Uh, so it tells you that there is a tremendous amount of diversity and it doesn't mean that our solar system is rare because uh, even though many of them have these so-called short period uh, uh, hot Jupiters and super Earths, uh, but many more do not have them. And uh, the absence of uh, any detection is not the same as the detection of absence. And uh, so we're, uh, we're still yet to establish whether the grand um, configuration of the solar system is really uh, really at odds with anything else. So any claim that other people claim that solar system is a rare event, and you can tell them they have no ground to make that argument. And uh, so it's almost like saying that I am unique because I have an accent and because I have certain particular type of 
cultural background, but that's if, that's if you concentrate on these uh, minute things. But if you concentrate on the overall picture of the planets, and uh, they all are very similar, these planetary systems. Now, the diversity also extends out to things like uh, planetary orbit. Some of these orbits are very odd, and uh, many of them uh, may even have orbits that's highly inclined to the spin of their whole star. And some of these uh, planets are found around uh, multiple uh, systems. And much of that contribution and discovery were, again, made uh, locally. Now, with this kind of new information, and also the information we obtained by solar system exploration and uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with space probes sending out there to uh, on various uh, space missions, and uh, also with the detection of uh, protostellar disks, now we all of a sudden have a vast input influx of data, and these data tells us uh, from different angles and uh, a large amount of information about the formation and about the evolution and about the structure of planetary system. For example, that when we look at these uh, planet search, what we find is that the systems are diverse and rich in population, and if we look at uh, uh, in protoplanetary disks, we're looking at the very nursery and where planets are emerging. And when we look at uh, the collection of meteorites and information that we obtain about solar system, we're really looking at archaeological uh, relics. And, uh, but with all these different pieces of it, uh, uh, you know, clues, and we can try to reconstruct the big picture. And uh, uh, so because most of us are specialists uh, in different parts of this puzzle, and uh, quite often people argue um, emotionally and about the importance of what they're studying, and that's not necessarily um, the most uh, um, global way of viewing you know, what is going on. So important, what is important is to put all of these things together and to determine whether what we're looking at is really uh, the relic of how the system st got started, or is it a reflection of uh, some as, as a survivors of chaotic evolution? So um, I would like to convince you by the end of this talk that uh, evolution played a major role in shaping uh, planetary system as we know it. Now, perhaps. Uh, the, uh, not the first person who had thought about origin of the solar system, but certainly the one who had made the largest impact was Laplace. Laplace, uh, based on his um, uh, understanding of the solar system in the sense of, uh, or maybe Copernicus' uh, idea of the, uh, of the solar system, and uh, that uh, that all of the planets are moving around in one given plane around the center uh, of the system, namely on the sun. And uh, this was deduced by looking at all of the planets and uh, their relative position in the sky and uh, how they all fall, you know, they move around in the ecliptic. So it was uh, fairly easy to deduce from that that there is, was once a plane. So um, uh, what uh, Laplace uh, suggested was the next most obvious thing, is that what you see here is what it has always been like. In other words, the planets form on this plane, and, uh, uh, and they've been orbiting around the sun for, uh, since their birth. And this is the so-called uh, Laplace nebula hypothesis. But the nebula hypothesis is based on the assumption that the planets are found near their birthplace. And what I'd like to uh, conclude at the end of this talk is uh, there has been a new paradigm shift. And uh, perhaps this idea of in situ formation uh, needs a major revision. 
Now, we start by looking at the basic concept that Laplace had uh, introduced to us, namely that the planets form uh, in a disk. And, uh, and that's based on the fact that all of the planets in the solar system orbit in one particular plane. Now, uh, but the Laplace uh, conjecture was not proven until around the end of the last millennium. Uh, in the early 90s, with a series of uh, infrared uh, telescopes, uh, including IRAS and followed by uh, Spitzer, and uh, we are able to um, detect the presence within these star-forming region, uh, such as molecular cloud cores, and we're starting to pick up uh, here is a Hubble uh, image and these probelets, and, uh, and uh, there have been follow up uh, um, spectroscopic uh, analysis of these systems to show that they actually produce infrared radiation, and, uh, uh, and perhaps the, the, uh, the commonly accepted model today is that this is because associated with a star formation process, and you may have gas clouds that's collapsing uh, onto the central region. In fact, if they had a little bit of angular momentum, they form a disk, and out of this disk, dust material, dusty material uh, condense and sediment, and eventually form planetary system. We see this whole sequence, and uh, not only um, in uh, uh, around uh, very young stars, but uh, slightly older stars, we see this transition into what is called debris disk. Now, um, what has happened in the last uh, five years has been the um, launch or the uh, commissioning or the, uh, the uh, operation, the start of operation of ELMA uh, at have come at Desert uh, Large uh, Millimeter Array. And uh, with this uh, incredible facility, uh, we're starting to be able to probe the very central regions and, uh, of these protoplanetary disks. And here is one of the first images uh, that came out. And here around uh, HL Tau, and, uh, and here is around uh, TW Hydri. And you can see that uh, there are clear structures in here and uh, uh, this surface is not made of very smooth uh, distribution of dusty particles, and that's producing the infrared light uh, and millimeter uh, radiation that this uh, telescope can detect. And instead, you see these concentric rings and with gaps in them, and sometimes with a hole right in the middle. And uh, this suggests that uh, these dusty, dusty disks um, actually, the dust in these systems certainly probably uh, moved around. And, um, and that's not a surprise when we look at our own solar system, uh, uh, you know, in that context, we can start to analyze in our own solar system some relics where uh, the leftover uh, planet formation. And uh, the nearest region we can start to pick some information up is from the asteroid belt, because this is also the location where many meteorites uh, are stimulated to, uh, to uh, uh, get their orbits destabilized, and they cross that of the Earth and fall onto Earth. Uh, some of these meteorites contain relic informations that dates back 4.6 billion years, and by looking at the, uh, the structure of some of these uh, uh, contradict meteorites, we can determine the time scale and the environment out of which that the solar system formed. Some of these meteorites seems, some of these chondro, uh, seems have uh, undergone tremendous amount of heating, and uh, uh, those type of heating event may not have happened in the very neighborhood uh, where they found, and, uh, but um, they may have occurred much closer to the sun, and then uh, got brought out to this region. Now, we see that even with um, the Stardust mission uh, that was launched by NASA uh, to collect some samples 
from a comet wild. And even in those examples, we see this type of uh, these uh, highly refractory grains, which are produced uh, under very high temperature, maybe 2,000 degrees. Uh, so that tells you that perhaps some of the grains had moved around in the solar system uh, you know, uh, during the formation of these objects. What is also interesting is when you start to look at uh, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, media, uh, sorry, uh, of the asteroids, and you can classify them into different groups. Uh, for example, these groups are called S group, and this type is called C type asteroids, and uh, these ones are more carbon rich, these are more silicate rich, and uh, so as a, uh, they give you some indication the condition under which that they were condensed from. And uh, uh, what you find is in the outer part of this uh, uh, asteroid region is dominated by the so-called C-type, and the inside is dominated by the S-type, and somewhere in between there is a little transition that took place. So um, that these meteorites or their original building block may indeed have moved around quite a bit. Now one way to make that movement is that in these disks, uh, when we have these disks, they contain both uh, gas, hydrogen gas, as well as uh, these dusty material, and the dusty material condenses, and, uh, uh, and the gas, uh, they're condensed in the gas, gaseous disk, and both gas and dusty material circulates around the central star, and, uh, but at a slightly different speed. Uh, the dusty material only feels the gravity from the central star and a little bit of uh, drag from the gas. Whereas the gas actually feels also a pressure gradient, and the pressure in the central region of the disk is relatively high, outside is a little bit uh, low, so as a result, there is a outward force to slow down uh, the, this, uh, the motion of the gas. So as the dusty particle moves around, it feels a headwind, and this headwind can lead to a orbital decay of the grain. And this was known already to Fred Whipple uh, almost uh, uh, five decades ago. And this type of process may very well lead to uh, the motion or the migration of grains. But it also pose as a major uh, problem. So if the grains keep on moving and towards the whole star, uh, when do we ever get the building block uh, um, to build, build the planets? So after all, we want to make the planetary system very robust. So there are many hypotheses that have been made and I won't go through uh, most of them because I won't have time, but let me tell you one last minute, uh, uh, you know, last minute uh, or last uh, stopping place, and, uh, uh, and, and this is near the very central region of, uh, of these disks. Uh, very often we see these disks, uh, not only that they have some sort of a structure, but we also uh, often see that they have a jet that's, uh, uh, that is uh, emitted from this uh, central star. And they thought that this jet is uh, uh, really channeled uh, by the magnetic field of the whole star. So you have a star here, and the star's uh, magnetic field actually open up a cavity in these disks. If these cavity exists, when we look at the very central region near here, then there is an emptiness here, so the pressure here is extraordinarily low, and the pressure uh, reaches a maximum, and then as it goes out, it declines. So the gas in here, because it feels a uh, pressure gradient that's pointing inwards, so that's adding it to the gravity, and then when they uh, try to achieve centrifugal balance, so this part actually move faster than the Kepler speed, and faster than the grains. Grains in this very region will want to move out a little bit from the larger region will want to come in a little bit. And as a result, they tend to accumulate 
near the inner region of the disk, provided the temperature there is uh, not too hot, and uh, so the grain can remain uh, solidified, and uh, then they can accumulate in this region, and eventually gravitational uh, collapse could take place. Now, um, once they start to form these objects, this turns out to be a very efficient way of forming, a very robust way of forming um, uh, planetesimals. And once you form this planetesimal, and then they will start to uh, perturb each other's orbit, and as they cross each other's orbit, they collide. We see clear evidence of collision when we even look at small size asteroids, and uh, not only we see there are craters around here, but some asteroids, such as asteroid Ida, even has a little companion around it, uh, dactyl, and uh, this dactyl, and uh, uh, this forms a, almost a satellite system, and it is highly possible that they were either captured um, by gravitationally or even uh, went through a little bit of collision. And uh, so through these type of collisions, and the planet's uh, planetesimals mass can gradually build up. It can uh, build up and collide and build up and build up and big, makes a bigger team. And eventually these teams uh, form what is called an oligarch. This is kind of remind me of the, uh, this uh, very area uh, 20 years ago when we had the dot-com craze and everybody and, and, uh, and uh, her brother well, want to form a new uh, company, but it didn't take very long before they were all consumed and merged and, uh, and dominated by a few oligarchs. And the oligarch has these uh, type of uh, masses, which are called isolation mass, and uh, basically they sweep clean anything within 10 hills radius of uh, their neighborhood, and, uh, and they can grow. And we see today, by looking at the exoplanets, uh, there is no shortage of building block material. And in fact, uh, here are the results coming out of the Kepler survey. And when we look at systems that has multiple, uh, multiple planets. And if we look at the mass of the individual uh, uh, planets, and we look at these systems, and uh, we find that the mass, you know, most of them are around the super, um, super Earth, about 10 or so uh, Earth masses, okay? But since they are in uh, multiple systems, I choose particularly because I want to make the point that in these multiple systems, when you add up all the wells of the individuals, and they are in excess, uh, you know, of 10 or 20 uh, Earth masses. There's plenty of them to make a big difference. And uh, as I will tell you, that there is a critical mass around 10 Earth's mass, and beyond which you can start to accrete gas and turn into gas giants. And the fact you don't see that many gas giants is not due to the lack of building block material. There are plenty of building block material, but uh, it is uh, the problem of getting their act together around the same star and actually combine their uh, their gravity, their wealth, and to form the core uh, of a much bigger uh, uh, planetary uh, embryo. And this is kind of, again, like this dot-com uh, era, and uh, very often that you have all these individuals, each one of them are starved of funding, and, but there's no shortage of individual. And if they can get their acts together, they can make a big team, and then they can grow into uh, much larger entities. And you can see this uh, not only for different mass stars, but also stars with uh, very different metallicity. And the fact that you can see all of these type of rich systems around stars with uh, you know, solar metallicity or even richer, it tells you that 95% of the heavy elements uh, that was available to form um, form planets and stars, went into the star. Only a small fraction that's left behind. And why is it only a small fraction? And uh, that's one of the key challenges which uh, we try to address, and that in the early stages of star formation, everything went through the disk, but nonetheless, 
when they come in the proximity of the star and uh, most of the condensates uh, evaporate and they get, get accreted onto the host star along with the hydrogen. But only during the late stages and uh, that region, they can start to retain these heavy elements in the form of these uh, 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 planet building blocks, planetesimals, and, uh, but to get them in this uh, way is very robust and they have to go through it and there are plenty of these objects. The next stage is that we need to know why, um, you know, you say, oh, you form these uh, uh, planetesimals very close to the host, but clearly we are not next door to the sun and majority of the planetary systems are not next door to the sun. Uh, what happened? Uh, your solution is not adequate. Well, uh, that is if you adopt uh, Laplace's uh, uh, dogma, namely that uh, planets always stay where they're formed. But in fact, these planets has a tendency to interact uh, with their neighbors. And uh, because their, their neighboring gas moves relative to the planets, as they pass the planets, they feel a little gravitational tug, and uh, so they get pulled a little bit. And um, let me see if I can make this run. Um, and they get pulled a little bit, and this leads to uh, the excitation of spiral density waves. And these spiral density waves are also seen in Saturn, and one of my colleagues, and NASA Ames, is a specialist in this area, had mapped out uh, these density waves in the early days. But in these planetary, uh, protoplanetary disks, they're there. And, uh, and when they uh, excite these uh, waves, the waves dissipate, and they leave behind um, angular momentum and from different sides. And this can cause. Um, a planet to uh, actually get receive angular momentum from the inside, give angular momentum to the outside. If that is not in balance, and uh, the orbit of the planet will move, and uh, uh, even though that it doesn't completely empty out the region near it, it can start to move. And this is kind of like um, the, for sailors, for people who like to sail, and is how you can actually sail upwind. Uh, in many ways as gas uh, pass by here and you feel this perturbation and these perturbation can cause a, uh, a movement. So this type of movement is called migration, planetary migration. Today we think that planetary migration is the most important process in shaping up the outcome of planetary formation. Uh, and what I showed you in this uh, movie was that the planet was moving inwards. Uh, a follow-up study suggests that they can move both inwards and outwards. In fact, uh, in the inner region of the disk, where the disk is heated by its own internal friction, and uh, in that region, uh, these uh, protoplanetary embryos tend to move outwards, and whereas on the outside, it tend to move inwards and give you another indication. Here is uh, the radius, and uh, in the inside, there's the red region tells you that it wants to move outwards. And this is not a political statement on the election, but it tells you which way things are moving. Okay, so you can have the inside move out, outside move in, and you get a trapping uh, location. Um, and eventually, when they get trapped into this region, and they get concentrated, and when they get concentrated, it's like a group of uh, snowboarders on a half pike, and, uh, and they keep on going up and down, and they will eventually collide. And, uh, so, uh, and when they collide, they can start to build up larger and larger cores, and eventually when this core becomes sufficiently large, it can start to attract gas around it, and uh, producing an envelope, and uh, eventually lead to the formation of gas giant. Perhaps one of the most important discovery in solar system exploration is that we find gas giants have uh, cores, have relatively solid cores, and one ongoing uh, uh, space mission right now is called Juno, and Juno is trying to measure uh, the mass and the radius of this core. 
So um, under what condition can you, um, can you cause this uh, migration to, uh, uh, to get things merged together? Under what condition uh, they will stay at arm's length? This is kind of uh, like, let me give you an analogy, and uh, when you try to put several eggs together uh, in the base of a bowl, and if they come in relatively gently, and all of the eggs are stay separated, uh, retaining their integrity. Whereas if you try to uh, force them to come together very fast, and you can break uh, the skin of the, uh, the grapes, and uh, get them to uh, coagulate into one big pile. And this depends on how fast you can push these plantesimals together, and that depends on how much gas there is in the surrounding region, and uh, this depends on um, the accretion rate in these, uh, in these uh, protoplanetary disks. It's difficult to measure how much gas there is, uh, and, uh, but the accretion rate is much easier to detect, and we can detect this type of accretion rate. We find that the more massive stars tends to have larger accretion rate, and as a result, uh, they are more likely to have these planetesimals crash together to form massive cores. Indeed, we find that uh, for in terms of stellar mass dependence, uh, that the more massive stars there are, and the higher the frequency that you will find gas giants. Um, and uh, now we look for signs where gas giants are formed, and one of the first attempts to do this was with these uh, uh, large telescopes, such as the Keck uh, telescope from the ground, and uh, they are trying to do this by looking at uh, the images, or actually Subaru and Keck, and they try to look at the images by covering up most parts of the telescope and only leaving behind a few holes, and you say, well, that's what a waste. But it turns out that by looking at this just with a few holes, and these holes can give you uh, an interferometer, and uh, you can actually uh, reduce um, some of the phase um, smearing and to get more information out than, uh, than you have uh, just with one uh, large uh, piece of glass. And from that, uh, one can already see there is evidence of some um, particular uh, features around a, uh, a uh, particular source. It's called Lake Calcium 15. And this is uh, an object that was done with a survey on the Lake Observatory. And uh, when they found these, uh, uh, you know, enhancement, light enhancement, and they followed it, over a course of a few years, and they find that these position of these enhancements actually moved. And one interpretation is that's direct evidence of some sort of accreting protoplanet. But uh, this is too early to tell, and uh, a much better and uh, more impressive uh, observations are done, uh, either with um, uh, the SEEDS program or uh, with ELMA, and this is by looking at the images of, um, of these uh, larger region of the disk and more extended out to 50 a year or so. And there, what you can already see is there some evidence of a spiral structure. And uh, the spiral structure has been simulated uh, at a much earlier time, before even 51 Pegasus was discovered. And the idea is that the presence of a gas giant in this environment can excite density waves that can propagate uh, both interior and exterior and to produce this type of spiral density wave. And today, and this has now become an industry, and uh, people try to interpret ELMA data based on that. And um, now, the, the next implication is that if you can generate spiral density wave, there's exchange of angular momentum. Now, while the whole disk itself is also evolving, and if you take an accretion disk, uh, and uh, if you concentrate it into a ring, and there's a ten general tendency after a short time that uh, the inner region of the disk loses angular momentum to the outer region, so uh, the inner region will shrink, the outer region would expand, so there's a general spread. 
So if you now put in the planet, along with the spreading of the disk, here's in time, here's in, in uh, radius, the distribution of the density. And as the density spread out, if you have a planet that opens up a gap, and then that planet should be able to move along with, uh, with the rest of the disk. And this may very well be uh, the main mechanism that causes the formation of hot Jupiters. And we actually today also see a large population of gas giants and uh, are locked in mean motion resonance, which is, did not come by accident, and that probably is a result of this uh, uh, migration. But the migration itself, um, it's a little bit too efficient, and we have a tendency for these gas giants always try to move into the sun. And when we look at the observation, we see that uh, whereas there are hot Jupiters, there is plenty of cold Jupiters and large, uh, with larger periods and large mass. And uh, of course, the hot Jupiters are the easiest to discover. So we have some uh, observational bias uh, to correct that observational bias when start to see that uh, the, the spread, the period distribution is relatively flat. And that tells you that you can't have this uh, migration, uh, type, type two migration, all the way to the whole star for majority of them. In fact, many of them must um, store their migration halfway. And one way to do that is to lose some mass along the way. And, uh, and then you, if the mass loss rate is uh, uh, very s uh, small, and then almost all of them uh, these uh, gas giants will spiral towards their host star on the inside, and the ones on the outside will go out. However, if you do it, just um, deplete the disk in the nick of time, and then you can slow it down. So one way to do it is to adjust the depletion time scale. We have some constraints on that depletion time scale by looking at uh, the typical age of protoplanetary disks from infrared observations. But there is also, on the theoretical side, you can see whether you can slow down type one migration, uh, sorry, type two migration. One idea here is that in this type two migration, in fact, uh, when you open up a gap, the gap is not completely clean. So there are still some flows from one side to another, and this will cause the surface density profile to have a shape that looks like this. With that modified shape, you can actually change the torque, and uh, you can reduce what is called the corrotation torque, and, uh, but still have maintained the Lindblad torque, which is more distant. So if material can go through this region, and then here I put in some dye, uh, the outside is white, the inside is black, and uh, uh, the planet is placed at this location, and over time, that this material gets onto the so-called horseshoe region, and then they can spiral in here, and then you can have uh, the diffusion of the white into the black region, and a uh, and little bit of black into the white region as well. And this can actually reduce, uh, not only reduce the corrotation torque, but also maintain the flow, so you can actually maintain uh, the Lindblad torque. And this type of process, um, let me see, this type of process may, have, uh, may be important, particularly important in slowing down the migration so their, their semi-major axis does not decay uh, over this period of time. Um, these works are still uh, ongoing and uh, much more will uh, come through. Um, and um, while you have this accretion, this flow around here and here, and uh, uh, how much of this material gets actually accreted onto the protoplanetary core, that's another issue. Okay, so um, I think I won't go through this. But um, after the formation of a gas giant, okay, and uh, the gas giant can perturb its neighbors. The gravitational potential has increased, and um, nearby, uh, embryos and planetesimals can get accreted. This is, again, kind of like dot-com uh, situation when you have uh, one or two big companies start to uh, uh, really grow fast, 
and it can consume a lot of, uh, a lot of smaller companies. And this is an important process because for the gas giants in this core formation scenario, and uh, when they accreted gas, the gas uh, was already drained out of heavy elements. So it, in principle, it should have subsolar uh, composition in its envelope. But we all know that Jupiter and Saturn has several times the solar composition. And uh, one way to do that is to have uh, their neighbors uh, other embryos come in to pollute the envelope and that along that line. Okay, so here, if they come too, too fast, they will actually uh, fly by. Okay, so, um, and uh, the formation of a gap can also uh, enhance the collection of additional embryos here and that collection gives you rise the possibility of forming subsequent generation of uh, gas giants. And in fact, most of the gas giants uh, that we see seems to have companions, and, uh, and using this method, you can actually even form uh, this, uh, these uh, extraordinarily uh, long period systems. Now, so, um, and then when you form multiple systems like this, and uh, now th this is like creating a uh, group of uh, uh, hostile siblings, and the siblings can interact with each other, they perturb each other, and there's a tendency for this perturbation to cause chaos. And uh, anybody who uh, grew up in a large family knows that. And uh, so the chaos can start to cause the orbit to cross, and when the orbit crosses, you have some, uh, their eccentricity gets uh, excited, and some get thrown out, and the one left behind becomes very eccentric. Uh, again, similar to many families. And uh, so this type of uh, excitation leads to the breakup in many of the system, and uh, in fact, this probably give uh, accounts for uh, the, the high eccentricity uh, that you see, oops, uh, let me go back a bit. The high eccentricity you see in many uh, planetary system, uh, the origin of this uh, dynamical diversity. Now, they can also cause the orbit to destabilize. Perhaps some of them get sent in uh, close to their um, uh, host star. If they can come in very close to their host star, they can get disrupted and, uh, or they can get captured by, um, by, the, uh, by the tide of the host star. Um, let me see, um, I meant to go forward. Yeah, okay. And, um, uh, and here is the leftover core, and the core gets stripped down and uh, may get captured and, uh, and form. Uh, this is the second way to form how Jupiter's or if, in fact, even close in, uh, close in um, um, super Earth. How do you prove that? Well, if there's this kind of scattering, you may think that these uh, planets will come in at a um, widely dispersed uh, angle, and uh, one possible way to do it is to measure uh, what is called the obliquity, that is uh, the spin axis of the star compared to the axis of the, uh, the orbit. And you can measure this with a method called uh, 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 Laughlin, uh, sorry, uh, rossiter McLaughlin effect. And this measurement has been done, and what is seen is that for stars who uh, are more like the sun, uh, these angles are all lined up, but for stars which are relatively hot, more uh, massive stars, and there, this angle is relatively random. So you may think this is a verification that uh, the scattering is a, uh, plays an important role. And, uh, but in order for this to take place, you have to have uh, the orbit circularized again and to be near um, the whole star. And one can show that this is very difficult to achieve with uh, the stellar and the planetary tides and partially because in order for this to, to be achievable, uh, they have to come sufficiently close that their orbit will start to uh, wind down before they're uh, lined up, okay. 
But what is interesting is even around these stars, which are massive and that uh, has high obliquity, and you tend to see that these are around stars which are uh, spinning relatively slowly. Usually, uh, massive star rotates fast, but these ones spinning uh, relatively slowly, and you can see it in terms of this uh, kind of dots, and the smaller the dots tells you that the spin rate is very uh, slow. The large dots uh, are fast spinners, and you can see that most of the fast spinners are lined up, and whereas the slow spinners are not. So there's possibility of another explanation one way to think about it is that these uh, uh, massive stars, they tend to have convective cores and radiative envelope, whereas the solar type stars tend to have radiative cores and convective envelope. Now, what, does, what difference does that make? Well, the thing is that when you have uh, this kind of uh, convective core with a radiative envelope, in the convective core, this is like boiling soup, and you put a lid over it. And when this thing boils and there are all these uh, convective cells push the lid up and down and cause the lid to go like this, and that can send a wave out there, and these waves can dissipate near the surface, deposit angular momentum. So even if you start with one particular type of angular momentum, you can end up with a different spin. So you say, this is crazy. But actually, there is uh, some experience we have every day. Namely, you take a cat to the fourth floor, and you hold the cat upside down, and you drop the cat. And what happened to the cat is the cat will end up on its leg. So you wonder, how did that happen? Because the cat started upside down and turned around. But I didn't start with a spinning motion. And so there's no angular momentum to begin with. There's no angular momentum to end with. And there's no torque applied in between. So if I take a slow moving, uh, camera of the cat, and I see from the head, it did turn. And where did the angular momentum go? It got redistributed throughout the body, so there's a differential rotation, and that may have caused uh, this thing to happen. We see this type of phenomena occurs in jet streams, and uh, uh, they can produce what is called 28 months uh, quasi-biennial oscillation on Earth, in the Earth's atmosphere. So if this happens, the prediction is that inside these stars, you may have differential uh, rotation and differential obliquity. And one way to measure that is with uh, stellar seismology, and uh, that is currently being done. So uh, I talked about migration. Let me uh, return back to the migration of the super-Earth, because we move them out, and how do we bring them back in? And uh, um, in fact, they can be brought in if there's a gas giant that comes in, and they can be pulled in. And uh, in fact, some gas giant has a super Earth companion with them. And this turns out to be a very good uh, way to explain as uh, evidence for core accretion scenario, because you have to form the super Earth first before form the gas giant. Now, uh, but there are many uh, super Earth systems without gas giants and that are actually um, multiple systems, coplanar, and how do you do them? How do you make them happen? Okay, one way to do that is uh, join the depletion of the disk and uh, this uh, trapping radius where outward migration and inward migration uh, actually meet and this, uh, this weather front, if you like, gradually retreats towards uh, the host star. And this retreat of the host star can, uh, this is uh, the location, this is time, they gradually can retreat, and they can move back in, and eventually, and they can get caught into uh, the magnetosphere, which itself expands a little bit, and uh, so there is a, lots of dance going back and forth, mirandering, and uh, in, in this protoplanetary disk during the advanced stage of this evolution. We see some evidence of that by looking at the period distribution. There are evidence that they're close to two to one resonance or three to two resonance, but not on it. And there are many ways to uh, achieve such a uh, configuration. So um, finally, I want to say that the super Earth itself uh, gets to the neighborhood of the planet, but then they don't. Uh, they can re maintain their integrity, not 
accreting a lot of gas. And the reason for it is because the size of these uh, uh, super-Earths uh, is typically of order 10% that of their Roche radius. And uh, whereas if you put them at 5 AU, and uh, uh, their size is now um, the same, but their Roche radius would increase by a factor of several hundred. So uh, near the host star, and there's not a lot of room for these gas to uh, get onto this region. So the gas flows around here as they flow near these super-Earths. You may think that they can cool down this super-Earths, but actually they also bring in a fresh supply of, of gas because the, they're embedded in this disk. And uh, when you look at the entropy from this region outwards, the entropy is more or less constant. And that constant entropy actually suppresses convection and uh, makes this region uh, you know, uh, maintain a thin envelope but does not accrete. We can put all of these effects into one giant population synthesis model. I heard people who had done that uh, with political campaigns and they try to find correlations of many different things, including what they eat for breakfast and uh, how they may vote. And uh, so you can do the same by looking at all these different effects and try to see if you can produce the period, uh, the mass versus period relationship and compare it with observation. There's still quite a bit of work to do and that uh, this type of comparison tells us uh, what we're still lacking in our theory. Let me just finish because I'm running out, I'm one minute overdue. And uh, uh, let me just say that theory is a very useful exercise for the interpretation of all these vast amount of data that's coming through in three different areas. Protostellar disk, uh, survey of um, exoplanets, and uh, in characterization of exoplanets, as well as uh, solar system exploration. Um, planetary astrophysics is a rich discipline which can uh, tackle at all levels. And what I told you, and I try to do it with, uh, uh, with a little bit of sugar, uh, and that can uh, you know, ease the, um, um, you know, this uh, understanding. Uh, but in fact, uh, it can also, I mean, much of this work is done with uh, incredible amount of both numerical simulations and analytic uh, calculations. Um, and uh, planet formation is a robust system of what I want to, uh, the information I want to carry with the title of my talk. It is a very robust system and their dynamical architecture can be very diverse. If there's a one message that I want to take home is the three most important uh, effects for planet formation is migration, migration, and migration. And uh, it plays a big role in the final destiny of planetary system. And this uh, theory is relevant on many other astrophysical contexts, including the generation of gravitational waves uh, around massive black holes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we do have some time for a couple questions, if you can stay for a moment. Please wait for the mic. Hi. Um, <clears throat> thank you. That was uh, very enlightening. Um, I have a couple questions about the formation of Jupiter and Jovian type planets in general, uh, which is um, if, if the magnetic field of a star plays a big role in clearing the protoplanetary disk, I'm wondering because Jupiter has a pretty hefty magnetic field, would that have formed early and played a role locally in the in, in clearing space around it? And also, were the Trojans formed in situ uh, at the same time or were they captured later or what, what's the theory there? Okay. So um, the first question, I think uh, uh, I'm really delighted uh, you asked that question. Um, so Jupiter rotates today uh, at uh, uh, 10 hours, roughly. And uh, that's, uh, that's nowhere near breakup. It's uh, three times slower. Uh, in fact, Jupiter was twice the size when it was first formed. So it actually rotated even slower than that. If it is fed by a disk, usually it should uh, be much faster. And the only way to slow it down is with an intense magnetic field. And in the early days of Jupiter, that uh, there's much more energy that's released that will come out of Jupiter. 
and the rotation was slightly slower. So therefore, actually, Dynamo turns out to be much more efficient. And uh, so you could have this process slow down the spin of Jupiter. It also carved out the cavity. And this is maybe the reason why the Galilean satellites stalled near where they are. And uh, so, so that's the first question you ask. The second question you ask is about uh, the Trojan satellites. The Trojan satellites may very well be formed uh, along these uh, horseshoe orbits. And as I showed you before, that there are gas that's trapped near those regions. And that remaining region uh, to capture some planetesimals is relatively easy. Thank you. Um, if you would please go back to the previous slide. So I just wanted to better understand what we're seeing there. Um, e represents? That's eccentricity. Eccentricity. Um, so, OK. Um, astronomical um, This units is distance, semi-major axis. And mass relative. And there is a mass of the planet. There are many things you can generate. You can, and then you make all these generations you compare with observation. The easiest to compare with current observation is the mass versus the semi-major axis, OK? Because the eccentricity is harder to detect. And so if I make this comparison right now, the comparison is not very good yet. But that's what we're working on and try to find after these comparison. It's n our attempt is not to reproduce simply just say, oh, you know, I can turn this knob, that knob, and get you this. It's really to understand what causes these differences and try to go down uh, in the understanding the theory at a deeper level. OK, so just looking simplistically at the lower left-hand graph, it seems to be saying that our solar system with rocky Earths uh, nearer the sun and gas giants further out is not typical. Um, uh, the, solar, the arrangement could be quite different in other solar systems. Well, for, on the, this is theory. Right. This is observation. Okay. okay. So, that, that's so, so the observation that. is very difficult to detect them at this point. Okay. It's very, very difficult. In theory, in fact, uh, there are elements of the theory. I said is incomplete yet. Okay. And uh, uh, I personally don't think the solar system is that unique. And I think that there are many ways you can get around to all of these problems. There are many effects I haven't put in here yet. Okay. okay, and here is the first order effect. And then there are lots of peculiarities. For example, how do you clear out the inner part of the solar system when you see so many super Earths? Well, when I mentioned to you that super Earths, the first generation super Earths or embryos were formed close to their host star and then moved out. During that migration, it could have acted as a sweeper to move along most of the stuff out, and uh, there are some debris left, and you pick up the pieces from there. Okay? But then we start to look at one particular system. And I actually spend a lot of time looking at this particular system. But to think that this particular system is so unique, then you should say, well, maybe are any of these physical effects that you include requires extraordinary uh, circumstance. My feeling is I don't think so. I don't buy the so-called Nice model that try to put everything into one giant type of tweaking. And I think the solar system could be much more robust. By the way, the dynamical evolution is very important in my mind for maybe the proliferation of life. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering now, uh, are you the same Lin who did the, with the Lin and Shu, the density wave theory of uh, galaxies back in what, the late 60s? I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. Frank, maybe. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, but uh, I wish I was. Uh, uh, however, uh, I use a lot of the results from there. Thank you. Maybe two more, and then and then we can conclude the formal version uh, session and go on after. 
Thank you. Uh, two questions. One, uh, what effect does the uh, uh, solar wind of uh, each one of these um, stars have on clearing out the, uh, the close-in area and perhaps uh, producing a formation of something fairly close in? Uh, and secondarily, uh, in the spiral formation of arms, is that a potential source of uh, multiple or twin gas giant uh, capability formation within a solar system? Okay, so the first question is wind. Wind probably played a role in clearing out the disk, residual disk. And um, uh, probably more dominant role was produced by the uh, radiative evaporation of the disk. But both may have played the important role, okay? Uh, the wind would be a little bit too, uh, uh, not sufficiently intense to cause the orbit of the planets to change a lot. So, but uh, it can change the environment, which would influence the dynamical evolution of the system. Um, the second question is that if you form a gap, okay, then the material from outside that wants to migrate will start to see a barrier in migration, okay? So this is like building a highway, and then you'll find that lots of deers cannot cross, and uh, it is acting like a barrier. And so the deer on one side will start to congregate on that side of the highway, and they may form a large herd. And uh, that's one way of producing multiple systems, and I think this is probably one of the most robust way of forming multiple systems. Thank you. Yes, the people that uh, find planets by gravitational lensing uh, tell us that their sample is uh, less biased than the other ones, and less selection effect of you know being close by. And they seem to be seeing a, a, a greater percentage or, uh, of uh, solar system-like systems. Yes. Um, the, I, I believe that uh, claim has been made. The problem with uh, gravitational uh, microlensing is that uh, there are lots of um, correction that has to be made. Uh, and uh, these corrections are very sensitive. Uh, to what assumption you make. And uh, so uh, if I take their uh, assumption at their face value, and what you said is certainly true. Uh, and, but they also come up with conclusions that there may be more freely floating planets in the universe than there are stars. Okay, and that is a little bit challenging even for an imaginative theorist like myself. <laughs> and uh, it's difficult to produce. We have a way to produce it, but I think it's highly unlikely. All right, Dr. Lin, thank you again very much. Thank you. Um, one of our SETI Institute traditions is to offer you a coffee mug so you can, can caffeinate yourself and enjoy doing more of your studies. Um, again, Please, everybody, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Lin.